This morning we're returning to uh, John chapter 17. As I um, have already mentioned to you, we're going to look just at a couple of verses, um, verses 4 and 5, but I'd like to read verses 1 through 5 as uh, we begin. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. And again, this prayer is quite full, and I don't want to just kind of blaze through it and forget what Jesus said, because we do learn a great deal about what eternal life is all about in this prayer. So John chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Again, remember, this is God's Word. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that the Son may glorify You, even as You gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom You have given Him, He may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom You have sent. I glorified You on the earth, having accomplished the work which You have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with Yourself, with the glory which I had with You, before the world was. May the Lord bless again His Word to our hearing this morning. Now again, last week we began to look at the longest recorded prayer that Jesus made for the church. As the priest, again, was, we saw before, was appointed by God to sacrifice for the people. Of course, in the Old Testament, animal sacrifices. And pray for His people in order to reconcile those people to God. Uh, So Jesus, as He was preparing to sacrifice Himself in order to take our sins away, He prayed for us. He prayed for the church. Now, He prayed first of all for Himself. He prayed for the strength to be able to finish His work, that He might be able to glorify His Father in really completing the work that the Father had given Him to do to allow Him to provide the basis upon which the Father could forgive us by shedding His own precious blood. He says in verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that the Son may glorify You. Glorify, Jesus says, glorify Your Son by giving me that strength to complete this work. He secondly gave a reason why the Father should hear Him. The Father had given Him authority had given Him really authority over all things, but particularly over the eternal destination of all men. Notice He says, to give eternal life to those He had given Him as the reward for His work. And so this forms an argument. Jesus argues the Father should give Him the strength to complete the work so that Jesus would have that life to give. Unless Jesus lays down His life, He cannot give life. And so he prays in verse 2, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And then Jesus went on to explain what that life is in verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, Jesus, when He said that, must have been actually saying that for the benefit of His disciples because His Father already knew what eternal life was. But what was Jesus saying about it? Eternal life is more than merely a condition of life, living in a world of perfect love and perfect happiness in the presence of God, in the presence of the Lamb and the saints and the angels. It's more than a duration of life, living in that condition for time without end, and that's actually a great blessing because when you trust in the Lord Jesus, you never go out of existence. Actually, nobody does, but in heaven, you will live there forever, either in heaven or the new heavens and the new earth, depending upon what time frame we happen to be in, but you'll never go out of existence, but enjoy that blessed world forever. It's more than those things. It is an intimacy, a relationship with the Father and the Son, a relationship in which we are bound together with the Father and the Son in love by that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's um, 
Something that Jesus is going to expound on more in this prayer helps us make sense out of what he's saying. He, he's explaining what eternal life is, it's the possession of the Holy Spirit and being bound together in love with the Father and the Son, even as they are bound together in love, so we are bound together with them in love. Now, let's remember as well that Jesus' prayer has already been answered. This prayer that he's offering up here, the new covenant church has already been established. Jesus has gone to the cross. Jesus has been raised, as this day reminds us. Jesus has ascended into heaven. The Spirit of God has been poured out. We have the Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts if we have trusted Jesus. What Jesus is speaking about here is not a mystery to us. It's something that we have already experienced. But because we still don't fully understand it, there's still a lot we can learn about it in this prayer. You know, it's funny. You can actually have something and not really understand what you have. But the more you begin to understand it, the more you can see what it is you're supposed to experience, the more you will actually experience it if you seek it in the way our Lord tells you to seek it. Well, having now prayed for the strength to do the work that was necessary to bring us, that is, His people, His reward to glory, Jesus now turns His attention to another aspect of the reward that was promised to Him by His Father, and that is that He might be glorified uh, with Him. Now, this morning I want us to consider two things from these two verses. First of all, that Jesus had met the condition. He had glorified His Father. And so, secondly, He looks to His Father to give Him what it is that the Father had promised to Him, the glory that He had with Him from eternity. Now, first of all, Jesus argues that He had met the condition of the reward. He says in verse 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, I want you to notice here that, that Jesus says there was a work that the Father had given him to do. We see the indication or the evidence that there was actually an agreement between the Father and the Son before Jesus came into the world. That Jesus came into the world to do a particular work that was, again, part of that arrangement, part of that agreement. Now, that agreement actually included all three persons of the Godhead, not just the Father and the Son, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we know from, from what the Lord reveals in His Word that His overarching plan, the reason why He does everything that He does, was to reveal Himself, to reveal His glory, not just a part of it, but to reveal all of it, to show us what He is like so that we might understand Him, we might know Him, that we might give Him glory and honor. Now, His work particularly was to reveal His justice and His grace through what He has done. And we've, we've heard this um, explanation before about the idea that the creation, I mean, why did God make all that He made? Why did He make the universe? Why did He make the world and everything in it? Well, it's, it's a grand stage in order to reveal His glory but we might look at it as the stage upon which the drama of redemption was going to be acted out. Now, not just acted, you know, it's action in the sense of His creatures making real choices, real decisions, and the Lord interacting with these people and bringing some to salvation. Redemption or the glorification of His justice and His mercy was also why the Lord created man, why He created us why He allowed the fall, why He chose to have mercy on some, and as you know, why He passed over others and left them in their sins. Now, I know that the, the church, broadly speaking, their understanding of what the Bible teaches is that God made everything for man, and His whole purpose is to make man happy, ultimately, and comfortable. But that's not why God made what He made. He made everything that He made for His glory, not for man's. And the fact that He decided to glorify His mercy by saving some is why we are blessed and why we benefit from this work. It's because God has chosen to show mercy upon us. He wanted to glorify His grace and His mercy. Now, 
I told you there was an agreement between the three persons of the Godhead. The Father's role, so to speak, was that He would... Well, actually, I'm going to describe this in two different ways, but let's look at it this way first. The Father's role was to choose a people. Jesus' role was to redeem that people. And the Spirit's role was to apply what Jesus did to the people the Father has chosen. That is what we call the, uh, well, the, the agreement between the three members of the Godhead. We, there's, there's different ways in which we refer to this, but it's called the economic trinity. But basically, this is the economy or the work of salvation, and these are the roles of the three persons in this work. Now, another way of looking at it is this. The Father provided the price of redemption. It was a very costly price. He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus is the price that was paid. He gave His life as payment for our lives. And the Spirit is what was purchased. His indwelling and His working His nature within the souls of those whom the Father chose and Jesus laid down His life for. So basically, the Father gives the price, Jesus is the price, and the Spirit of God is what Jesus purchased for us so that we might come to know Him, that we might trust Him, that we might love Him, and that we might actually become like Jesus. Now, these were the different parts, these were the different roles, these are the different work the three persons did in His prayer. Jesus tells the Father that He had done His part. He held up His end of the bargain so to speak. Now, notice he uses the past tense in verse 4 as though it's already completed, even though the most important part was yet ahead of him. He says in verse 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Jesus means by this either that he had done everything that needed to be done up to that point or that he was so certain to finish it because he had prayed and he had asked the Father for the strength to give him glory and he knew the Father was going to answer that prayer and give him that strength and that he was going to complete it, that on the basis of the fact that God was going to answer that prayer, he had already considers the work to be done. But you see, it's on the basis of this completed work that Jesus is going to make his request. Now, let's just pause here for a minute because there, there's a huge application here with regard to, and, and hopefully we've, you've already seen that and we've been making that point, that Jesus did all these things in order to save us. But we do need to remember the other point is that he saved us so that we might take part in this plan too, okay? Now, Jesus had this or the, 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 the triune God had this plan from all eternity, and we've already seen what that plan was and the roles of the different individuals, uh, individual members of the Godhead. But we have a part to play in it as well, don't we? Uh, Jesus wasn't the only one who had a job to do in God's plan. The plan also included all of us. The Lord redeemed us for a special purpose. Actually, He redeemed us for several things, and... And this is not an exhaustive list, but let me just mention a few. He did redeem us so that He might glorify His grace and His mercy, as I've already said. We, by His grace, are the trophies of His grace that He is going to put on display throughout all eternity. I mean, who is it that's going to be able to see it? Well, certainly we're going to be able to see it, and we're going to be able to look at one another and say, hey, God had mercy on us and to praise God for that mercy. The angels are going to look at it and say, God has had mercy on these. And you know what? The souls of those who are in hell are also going to be able to see it, although they're not going to praise God. But it's going to, of course, increase their sorrow and judgment that they didn't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we will be the monuments. We will be the trophies of His mercy. Secondly, He did this work so that we might become like His Son. Remember that Paul tells us that Jesus' reward is that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, those brethren are those who are like Him. And the Lord is making us like Him so that we might be Jesus' brothers and sisters 
and that we might be His rewards. Jesus really wouldn't enjoy us if we weren't like Him. So we need to be thankful that the Lord is making us like Him and eventually will make us exactly like Him. But He also saved us, and His purpose behind saving us was so that we might have the very high privilege of bringing the message of what He has done to save mankind to as many people as possible. In other words, we have a role in the work of redemption as well. We don't save ourselves, and we can't save other people, but we can take what Jesus has done, that message, to other people so that they can be saved. Now, since He's given us this work, He's also given us the means to do it. He has given us His Word. He's given us the gospel. And He has given us His Holy Spirit so that we'll want to do this and become like Jesus so we'll be good examples. But He's also given us, as we've seen recently, prayer. Jesus already told us in chapter 16, verse 23, Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, He will give it to you. And do you know that that promise is so certain to be fulfilled, that the Father is so certain to hear and answer us, especially when we ask for the strength to do what He has actually saved us to do, which is to bring the gospel to others, that He will hear us, and we can know that He has heard us with the same kind of certainty that Jesus knew the Father had heard Him when He prayed, Father, glorify Your Son. He knew so certainly that the Father was going to answer him that he even spoke as though the work that he had asked him for the strength to do was already done. When we pray, we can know he's heard us. We can know that he's answered us. Now, again, it may not always be the answer that we want. May not be, you know, he may not answer it in the way that we think he's going to answer it, but he will always answer those prayers in the way that we need and in the time in which we need it. So let's remember, first of all, why He saved us, what He has done to help us uh, in order to do why he, the thing He has saved us for, which is that we might glorify Him on earth, even as He glorified His Father on earth. And let's be encouraged to put our hands to the plow, to do the work that He's called us to do. Now, Jesus did what He did not only to bless us with these very high privileges that I've just talked about, to be trophies of grace, to reflect His image, and to be His ambassadors, but Jesus did what He did also to give us the means to carry it out. So Jesus has done this work for us, but in the process, He gets a reward, and that's what we want to look at now. On the basis of the fact that Jesus met this condition, he prays that the Father would give him what was promised in this eternal agreement. The glory that he had with him from all eternity, he says in verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, we've already seen a part of Jesus' reward. There's actually several different parts of it. This isn't all of it. But one part of it is He was to receive a people who were like Him that would be His brethren. We also know He receives all honor and glory and authority in heaven. Okay, in heaven and on earth to rule and overrule all things for the good of His kingdom. He has the authority to give eternal life to whom He wills. Now, those are all different aspects of His reward, as well as the promise that all of His enemies are going to be subdued under His feet. But I want you to notice here that there is something else. There is also glory. Now, notice a few things about what Jesus says about this glory. First of all, it is a glory that belongs to the Father as well. Jesus says, glorify me together with yourself. That's, that's important. I want you to you know, make a note of that. It's a glory, Jesus said, that He had before with the Father. That is, He may not have had it on the earth, but He had it with the Father in heaven. He says, with the glory I had with you. And it's a glory that He had in eternity. The glory I had with you before the world was. Now, when we think about these different aspects of, of glory, that it's the Father's glory as well, that Jesus had it 
before and he had it in eternity, what kind of glory are we talking about here? Well, it could only refer to divine glory, the glory that belonged to Jesus as the, as the Son of God, as part of the triune God. Jesus is basically telling us here that he existed with God in eternity with the glory of God, the full glory of God. Now, by the way, I just wanted to mention that because here's a passage that you can add to your arsenal of scriptures when you're talking to people that you know don't believe that Jesus is God to show them that, in fact, he is. Because who possesses the glory of God in eternity but God himself? But now Jesus does say, grant to me that glory that I had with you. Notice it's, it's past tense, isn't it? So we have to ask this question, did Jesus somehow lose that glory along the way? I mean, what happened? Did he give it up when he became a man? Well, now here's where we have to put our thinking caps on a little bit because we do need to understand the relationship between the two natures of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said he had it in eternity. We know from Philippians 2 and from what we see in this passage that He is God from all eternity. Did Jesus cease to be God when He became a man? Well, no, He didn't. Jesus as God can never change, which means He can never lose this glory. God is one who is always the same. That's what the author to the Hebrews means when he writes in Hebrews 13 verse 8, Regarding Jesus, he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The idea of the unchangeableness of God also applies to Jesus Christ. So whatever was true of his divine nature could not have changed. Whatever glory he had as God, he must still have. So what is Jesus talking about here? Well, what he's talking about is, as a man... This is something that he actually never possessed. Remember, Jesus has two natures. The divine nature has certain characteristics, certain attributes that are true of the divine nature. And his human nature has certain characteristics, certain attributes that are true of his human nature. And in his human nature, he has not received this glory. Okay, so basically this is Jesus praying that the Father would bestow this glory upon him. Now here... Think about Philippians 2, being in the form of God. Well, I'm going to read that in just a moment. Jesus didn't give up anything when he became a man. He didn't give up anything that belonged to his divine nature. He didn't strip himself of his divinity. He didn't give up any of his attributes. You'll hear that taught today in a variety of churches because that's the way they make sense. Jesus stripped himself of his divinity. He became just a man. And then when he leaves this world and goes back to heaven, some believe he strips himself of his humanity and becomes again just God. But that's not what happened. When Jesus emptied himself, he didn't give up anything. He actually gained something. He took to himself a human nature. Now again, we read earlier in Philippians 2 verses 6 and 7 this. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Now, how did he do that? Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. I want you to notice that Paul does not say he divested himself of his divinity, but he emptied himself by taking something to himself. He, his, his emptying was an addition, not a subtraction. The addition of a nature well, how can adding something take away? How can that be an emptying? Well, when you're God and you take to yourself a nature that is infinitely below you, that is an emptying. And there's really no analogy that we could use to refer to that, you know, as far as what we might do. You know, we emptied ourselves and became a molecule or we became, you know, an amoeba or something like that. An amoeba is way above a molecule. But... Um, the, the, the comparison, the difference would be vastly greater for God to become one of his creatures, but he became one of his creatures without ceasing to be God. Okay, here's the point. Now, do you realize that that's exactly what the temple was a picture of? You know, God's divine presence dwelt within the walls of the temple, and it was hidden 
by the veil. Remember the veil that separated the holy, the holy place from the Holy of Holies so that nobody could see the glory of God that was inside the Holy of Holies because if they saw it, they would instantly die. Well, in the same way, Jesus' human nature, the Bible tells us, was like a veil that was veiling His divine glory, His divine nature that kept men from seeing who Jesus really was. I mean, when Jesus walked around, you couldn't see His divine nature. All you could see was the man, Christ Jesus. Although there was one occasion where Jesus appears to have pulled the veil back a bit and revealed something of His glory to His disciples, at least three of them, on the Mount of Transfiguration and where He began to shine and glow with that effulgence. Now, the author of the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 22, and see if you can't see what it is that he's talking about, Jesus and the temple. He says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the, the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened to the veil that was in the temple? It was torn from top to bottom. Jesus, when his body was torn, the veil was rent and the way into the holy place was open. That's exactly what the author to the Hebrews is telling us. His humanity was the veil. It was basically the veil in the temple was a picture of that humanity. When the veil, the humanity was torn, as it were, was rent when he died, the, the veil was opened up and the way into heaven was opened to us, the way into the holy of holies, into the presence of God. So what I'm saying here is that Jesus, when... He became a man. He didn't give up his glory as God. What he did was he was veiled. That glory was veiled by his humanity. And now that he has accomplished this work for which he became a man, he prays that the Father would take that glory and bestow it on him. Now, not on his divine nature because his divine nature never lost it, but rather on his human nature would bestow it upon him as the mediator as the God-man, as the reward for his work. You know, again, I think the, the, the difficulty we have in seeing this is the fact that we always conceive of Jesus walking around as basically God, and we don't, we don't see him as a man, but he's fully a man. And as a man, in that humble state, he was exalted. We just read about it in Philippians 2. And as a part of that exaltation, he receives glory. That's his human nature that is being glorified with some of that divine glory that belongs to the Father. And I think that's something that only the God-man can possess. God wouldn't give that to just anyone. So that is a part of that reward. Now, Jesus is our example. I already told you that Jesus came into the world and He saved us for different purposes. One of those purposes is that we might complete the work He has given us to do. But even as Jesus was given the promise of reward for doing what what the, basically the work the Father sent him into the world to do, which was to save us, even so the Father has promised us a reward for the work that we do, which is made possible now because of what Jesus has done. The Lord has also promised us glory, but not the same kind of glory. We don't get divine glory, but we do get a reward for the work that we do for him. Now, that glory or that reward is represented in different ways in Scripture. Sometimes it's represented as crowns. You know, you kind of get this idea you're going to have the stack of crowns on your head, you know. Uh, I, I think this might just be imagery and that we're not going to have literal crowns. And, you know, it wouldn't matter to you or to me whether you had a crown or not. But the things that they represent matter, okay? A crown of righteousness, a crown of life, a crown of glory, these are things promised to those who serve the Lord in this world. Sometimes that reward is represented as a visible brilliance. And as a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus, when He is in heaven, when He appears after He ascends into heaven in His glorified state, what does Paul see on the road to Damascus? 
a, a light that is so bright and blinding that it knocks him off his horse. He can't see. It's because of, of this effulgence, this, this brilliance that our Lord Jesus is glorified with now that he appears in his glorified state. Well, the Bible says that if we serve the Lord faithfully, that we also will shine. In Daniel 12, verse 3, we read this. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I believe Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 15 that as the stars differ in, in their brightness, so we will differ depending upon the amount of glory the Lord bestows upon us. Sometimes these rewards of this glory are represented in Scripture as gold, silver, and precious stones. We know that we can you know, build upon the foundation that the Lord lays in our lives of the Lord Jesus Christ with wood, hay, and stubble, which is all going to be burned up and gone. But there are other things we can do which will last, things that are worthy. Well, I'll, we'll talk about whether they're worthy of reward or not, but things that the Lord actually says He will reward us for, represented as gold, silver, and precious stones, or... It can simply be referred to as glory. Paul writes in Romans 2, verses 6 and 7, that God will render to each person according to his deeds, and deeds works according to what he does. Notice, I'll leave the, the negative part out here, but notice about what he says about the righteous. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, and honor and immortality, eternal life. Okay, that's what he's going to give them, eternal life. Now, they don't earn that. It's not something they work for. We know that's a free gift. But I want you to notice what it is that Paul says they are seeking for, okay? They seek for glory. They seek for honor. They seek for immortality with perseverance, and they seek it by doing what is good, okay? So, like I said, it, it comes into the purpose for which our Lord saved us, that we might do good. Now, this reward, this glory that He promises is found in the same path that Jesus took. Jesus did the work the Father gave Him to do, and He received His reward. If we do what the Lord commands us to do, then we also will receive a reward. But now here's, here's where the dis disjuncture is in this parallel. Jesus is rewarded according to what He did. He earned that. He deserved that. But we don't, you see. Any reward we get is purely a reward of grace because we can only do this work through the strength that Jesus gives us. We can't do it on our own. And because our works are not perfect, uh, we can only receive these rewards, and those works we do can only be received by the Father through the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are rewards of grace, but God has promised to give them to us if we will serve Him. And we're all going to serve Him to one degree or another, but to the degree that we serve Him, to the degree that we minister to one another, to the degree that we show kindness to those outside the church, to the degree that we share the gospel with other people, to that degree we will receive reward. To that degree we will be glorified when we finally leave this world and enter into heaven. So this morning I just want to leave you with this one thought. Let's be encouraged to follow our Lord's example the example that He left us in the table. Jesus laid down His life. He gave Himself fully to His Father to complete that work He gave Him. That entailed going to the cross in order to redeem us, and Jesus has been glorified. He has received His reward, and again, that's multifaceted. Jesus says to you and me this morning, follow my example. I've opened the door for you. I've laid out these rewards for you. I love you. I've given you my spirit, I've given you my word, I've given you prayer. Ask, ask for the strength that you need, and I will give it to you. But there is a reward laid up for you. If you will follow my example and lay down your life and serve me, 
He says, I will give you glory. So let's think about that as we come to the table this morning because that is what our Lord Jesus calls us to do. So as we come to the table this morning, I just want to remind us that, um, again, our Lord calls us to renew our covenant with Him. He calls us to, um, you know, repent of all of our sins. And in light of what we've just seen this morning, as we look at our lives and we think about, you know, what am I actually living for? What am I seeking after? Am I seeking for those things that the Lord sought me for? Am I living for myself or am I living for Him? The Lord wants us to live for Him. So if we find that we are not giving ourselves to Him in the way that that Jesus gave Himself to the Father, well, that's one thing, one area in which we need to repent and renew our covenant with the Lord and seek to do, as, as the Apostle Paul reminds us, to do everything that we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, to the glory of God of God. So let's, let's bow for a few moments and let's, let's prepare our hearts to come to the table and let's renew our commitment to love and serve the Lord.